Uh, let's go ahead and uh, open our Bibles this morning, and let's find uh, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And by the way, if you didn't bring any food today, maybe you weren't able to bring anything, you eat with us. No problem at all. That's not that kind of way to where you can't stay and eat. Don't even feel bad about it. E eat a ton of stuff. So uh, the church bought food anyway, so you can eat what the church bought. The uh, church bought some deli meat. But uh, John chapter 12, uh, verse 12, oh, oh, I meant to say, and we are canceling tonight's service. So I'll send a text to those that uh, maybe uh, weren't here this morning, but there is no Sunday evening service. I felt with all we've got planned, you know, we're just going to, we're just going to have a great time, enjoy our day, and just, uh, let's, just let's just, let's just praise God after all that happens today. We're going to, we're going to see a baptism. We're going to see people join the church, and let's just rejoice in that, and just no evening service. We'll, we'll be back on track next Sunday, but John chapter 12, we're going to look at uh, verses 12 through 21, and the Bible says here, on the next day, much people that were come to, to the feast, um, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm, leaf, palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that, that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he had called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. I, hope, I, would, I would wish that were the case, but the Pharisees said, Oh, we don't have the people anymore. They're following after this Jesus. And what an amazing uh, passage of scripture of how they laid down palm leaves. Other scriptures say that they also laid down their clothing as he came in and, per, and fulfilled prophecy. But I want to preach a message this morning. Is the king your king? Or is uh, the king should be thy king? The king should be thy king. So both those phrases are in there, the king and thy king. You know, really, that's what he was offering himself. You know, they, they wanted that redemption from Rome. They didn't want a savior that would die for their sins. And so, in many ways, the king, which they had honored right here, wasn't their king, wasn't their, uh, their own king. They didn't make it personal. So is the king of kings your king? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, would you help us as we look into the, your word? May the Holy Spirit of God lead us into truth. May he take over do his wonderful work of convicting and leading and teaching and showing spiritual things to our heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would have the, 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 you would have the preeminence, you would have the authority in these moments to teach your word. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The phrase king of kings is used in scripture six times. Once the title is applied to God the Father in 1 Timothy 6.15 and twice to the Lord Jesus in Revelation. You know, and other times in Ezra, Ezekiel, and Daniel, it's referred to an earthly king. You know, it's actually used in reference to that. Artaxerxes and uh, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as, a, as a, a king of kings. But every time that it's used in reference to an earthly king, it'll, it'll usually, it won't put the A there, but it's implied. A king of kings. And Nebuchadnezzar was a very powerful king. He was a king of kings, but he was not the king of kings. And same with uh, Artaxerxes. He was a powerful military uh, a leader and king. He was a king of kings. He was a leader among other kings, but he wasn't the king of kings. You see, in Revelation 19, 16, Jesus is given the full title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In 1 Timothy, we, we have that verse, which I mentioned, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 17, 4, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Praise God. And uh, let's all turn to, to the Revelation passage, Revelation 19, which is one of my favorite passages in reference to his authority, his kingship. But Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11, and we'll read through uh, verse 16. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he just judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
And he was clo uh, and the armies which were in heaven follow him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth went, uh, goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. First of all, this morning, I want you to see the next day. First of all, I want you to see the next day. Now, they honored him as king, but they didn't recognize all that it meant. I want you to recognize all that it meant. So if we could, just go back to John 12, 12. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John 12, 12. And the Bible says that on the next day, on the next day, much people that were coming to the feast when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, on this next day, were a week away from the crucifixion, were a week away from his death and suffering. And on this next day, the Lord's Day, or Sunday, one week before, the 10th day of the Jewish month Nisan, on which the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Passover lamb was about to be set apart to be kept up that 14th day of the same month, the whole assembly and congregation of Israel were to kill it in the evening. Even so, from the day of the solemn entry into Jerusalem, which we see happening on this very day, Christ, our Passover, was virtually set apart to be sacrificed for us. If you think of all the implications of their taking that physical lamb and setting it apart for their Jewish Passover, which will then be likened to Jesus himself, they're doing this and they're setting apart that earthly lamb, and Jesus, the king of kings, the king of lambs, he's setting himself aside on this next day. What does this next day imply? Was well, the culmination of his earthly ministry. Think of all that he did, all the miracles we love to hear about, water to wine, a healing uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, you know, of the blind and of the lame, and all that he did, preaching the gospel with the Beatitudes, uh, uh, the woman at the well, uh, he's, he's the living water, all these things we know about him, the culmination of his earthly ministry. But, you know, I want to, see, I want to, I want to point out one thing of his earthly ministry in the previous, uh, in the previous verses of this very chapter. Look at uh, Luke, uh, John 12, uh, verse 1. Just go back to um, the first verse. It says, uh, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus had been, uh, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And they had made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And I, I, Lazarus wouldn't leave his side after he rose from the dead, uh, after Jesus resurrected him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Or why was not this ointment sold? You know, so the, the money changer, Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray Jesus, said, hey, we ought, we ought to sold this. we got to use that money for something. But yet uh, Mary took it and offered it to the Lord. Uh, then he said, not, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Praise the Lord. And on the next day, much people were come to the feast, and when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So you see the culmination of what, what was happening. Uh, Lazarus was, was, uh, he was raised from the dead. You see that Mary uh, anointed his body for, the, for preparing for the burial and recognized that Jesus would, would be the sacrifice. And then all these people gather around, maybe see another miracle or hear another great teaching. You know, it was a satisfaction of his biblical prediction. You know, down through history, God provided us a road map. He foretold various signs and conditions through his prophets. These prophets spoke of those things to mankind, and they should watch for that Messiah, the Messiah here that is in our context, that is presented to his people. You know, he'd be recognized and believed. These signs and prophecies were given to us in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is part of the Bible written before Jesus was born. It's written and completed uh, 450 years before he was born. The Old Testament, written hundreds of years before this, contains 300 prophecies that are going to predict that Messiah would do these things. Even the very thing of them laying down the palm leaves was predicted in Scripture. You know, mathematically speaking, of those 300 prophecies, if you just, uh, anyone fulfilled just, uh, just a few of these, would be mathematically impossible just to fulfill, to, to fulfill a few prophecies. 
You know, it, com it comes to one in like 100 uh, gazillion. It's one person fulfilling 48 prophecies. It's a one in a chance of 10 to the 157th power, a mathematical impossibility. One person could, could not fulfill 300 prophecies unless it was God orchestrating all of it and God in the flesh. And Jesus fulfilled the culmination of prophecy in reference to the Messiah. Also, this next day implies it's a retribution of his enemy's obsession. You know, if you look at the end uh, of, uh, of chapter 11, they were looking to kill him. Look at chapter 11, verse 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel, or they, took, uh, they, they started talking together for, the, for to put him to death. Hey, we've got to kill this guy. He's against, uh, he's against our, our, our fair sake old religion. He's against uh, what we stand for. He's perverting the nation with, their, with his teachings that God loves people and wants to save them. And it's a retribution of his enemy's obsession. It's also an intermission of his pending passion. One week before, a holy commercial, a holy pause before the resurrection and ascension. You know, in Luke 9, it says, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. So this was a intermission, a brief, uh, a brief uh, pause before all this was, was to happen. And then also this next day implies it's an indication of his eminent revisitation. You know, he is coming again. And, and, and you look at many verses for this, but in Acts 1.11, when he ascends to the Father after he raised, raised from the dead, it says, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. You know, in Acts 2, when Peter preaches to that great crowd, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know shortly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Here they're honoring, honoring him as a Lord, as a king. But yet in a week, week's time, they're going to yell, kill this man. So number two, let's look at the king. Look at the king. So uh, John 12, 13, 12, 13. The Bible says they, they, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know what they weren't crying? They weren't crying unto him, save us. We're, we're sinners. We need a savior. They weren't crying out, please die for our sins. We need, a, we need a sacrifice. We need a perfect sacrifice. Jesus, we need you to save us because this lamb cannot save us. They weren't crying that. They weren't crying out for a savior. They said, hey, finally, we have redemption from the political oppression. Finally, we have a king that can be over us and get us out of Rome. We're oppressed under the Roman Empire. Well, we need a king. We need a king. Isn't that the cry today? It's still today. It's still the cry. We need a, a better president. We need a, a godly president. We need a king. We need a president. We need a president that's godly and spiritual. Still today. We don't, we don't want a savior. We want a king. We want a president. It was still in their day. But he is the king. Recognize it. He was their king. He, was, he just came first to die for their sins. You know, uh, when Jesus is called the king of kings and lord of lords, it means that in the end, all of the rulers will be conquered or abolished. No wonder he will set it right. He will, he will defeat all the kings, all the presidents, all the rulers. He alone will reign supreme as king and lord of all the earth. There is no power, no king, no lord who can oppose him and win. Now let's kind of look at the branches a little bit. Look at verse 13. It says they took these, uh, these branches or palm trees, these palm leaves, the branches, as we kind of have an example of that in the back. Uh, it would have been, been uh, the whole leaf more than likely. And as, as that tree was a sign of joy and victory, they carried these branches uh, in their hands as they met the King Messiah, who was about to make his public entrance into Jerusalem. In triumph and whereby his sufferings and death, he should gain the victory over sin. See, they, they, they could not even comprehend that. Satan, the world, and death had laid a solid foundation for joy and peace for all that believe in him to redeem them from it. I mean, from the beginning of time, from Genesis, Satan had ruled. He had taken joy from people. He had taken salvation from people. Now mankind needed to, to go through a believing in what God was going to do by sending a Messiah and believe in that gospel story given way back in Genesis 3.15, repeated all throughout the New Testament, and with the gospel in which we believe. And so those branches, they only focus on one part of it, that he's the king of all the earth, but he wasn't the king of their heart, king over their sin. Levit Leviticus 23, 30, 40 says, And you should take you on the first day uh, the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So it was within their culture, within their Judaism, it was in their teachings in the Old Testament. They were to do this, and they, they fulfilled prophecy as they did that. 
And, and even in Psalm, it would mention that his name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So we see these branches focusing on his victory, and it should have been victory over their sin. But number two, the blessed. Look at verse 13. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. In ancient times, palm branches symbolized goodness, well-being, victory, as we said before. Now, they often depicted on coins. You know, have a Roman ruler, and it would have a, a wreath or whatever, or at least it would be on the side of the coin, or important buildings it would be inscribed upon. Even King Solomon had palm branches carved into the walls of the doors and temples. It was even required, as God gave him the blueprint, they, they were to do this to the walls. It symbolized victory. It's amazing this same crowd is going to kill him in just seven days. Just amazing. Uh, they honor him to such a great degree as, as if he conquered the wars of, all the, all of the entire earth, and yet they, they reject him. You know, Luke reminds us our perspective. Luke 6, 46 says, And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, if we call him Lord and Master, King of all the earth, why don't we do what he says? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth, heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom is like. He is like a man who built his house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. You know, if we believe he's the king, if we believe he's the king of all of the earth, and, and we believe that he's coming again to be king, 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 king of kings and lord of lords and defeat all uh, unsaved man, well, can he be the king of my life right now? Can he be the king of my neighborhood? Can he be the king of this island? Could he be the king of New York? Well, absolutely. Let's let him be the king, which, which he is. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation, built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. So we believe he's king, but we don't act like it. We have, we have the wrong foundation. Number three, let's see, look at the beauty. Look at verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, the king, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. See, God made it very clear, even in the Old Testament, as it's prophesied and fulfilled right before our very eyes, within their context of this verse, it, it, he, the, the king should have been their king, thy king. You see what God implied here? Uh, God said in verse 15, he should be thy king. Don't just uh, praise God and say, he is the king, he's the king, he's the king coming. But no, he should be your king. You, you see what God's trying to tell them? He should be thy king. He's for you. He's for you, not just to be uh, conquer Rome, but to conquer your sin. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him in the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Who being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He could have wiped out all the Pharisees. He could have wiped out all the unbelievers. He could have conquered uh, uh, all the nations of the world, but he did not. He humbled himself to the cross. You know, John, as well as Matthew, sees here a symbolic fulfillment of what had been declared by one of the latest of the prophets as, the particularly, uh, as a peculiarity of the Messiah. You know, fear not, daughter of Zion, which is a reference to, to Zechariah, almost before the, uh, God stopped giving the uh, Bible through the four and silent years. And he admitted by the commentators, and the opposite schools uh, referred this to the Messiah, and there's no question that there was no need in order to fulfill the spirit of the whole passage that the king should come to his own literally upon the beast of a burden, this, uh, this donkey. The prophecy does, however, suggest the modesty, the absence of a pomp, all pomp and display of worldly wealth and power, nay, the humiliation on the part of a true king. Boy, praise God. You know, you know when we think of what a king should be and what a president should be, we often think wealth, power, Fancy cars, you know, those armor-plated cars that the presidents drive around in. I know, and I say, you know, the, the White House looks like an old house, but it's a completely modern as for what it's able to do and protect the president from. I mean, often, it, often there's people that will fly into the White House or try to bomb things, and it, it's, a, it's a fortress, you know. We think of, like, all the, the wealth and protection and the, uh, the, just the power that comes with being a president or a king. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't roll up in an armored car. He didn't have an armor-plated horse and, uh, you know, gold-aligned robes and, and all that. He came just sitting on a donkey, coming in to fulfill the humility of what was going to transpire just a week later. So that's the beauty of it. So number three, I want you to see the people. Number three, I want you to see the people. 
Look at verse 16. These things understood not as disciples. Often they wouldn't understand because uh, they too were kind of duped to think this is, the, this is our king. This is the redemption from Rome. We finally have it. So they understood not the disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remember they these things which uh, were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people. And really many people are the same way. People don't understand. People think that Palm Sunday is about palms. You know? They go, oh, it's, it's just a, I get that little palm leaf. I, I remember getting that as a kid or something. You know, a lot of these Catholics in, in the island, they think that's what it's all about. Just I get that palm leaf. You know, it's not about palm leaves. It's about Jesus, you know. It's not about, uh, it's not about all the, uh, these other frivolous things. I was telling somebody, you know, I was explaining our church. We're just very simple. We don't do much. We don't have uh, all the fancy things that a lot of bigger churches have, uh, which is, is kind of refreshing, you know. Because uh, if you take all of it away, what is a true church? What's a biblical church? It's just preaching Jesus. It's just showing him to the world. It's what they did in the book of Acts. They just preached Jesus. Uh, you know, Peter gets up outside of a church building and preaches on the day of Pentecost. He just preaches Jesus. He goes, you crucified him. You crucified your king. And so they didn't understand that. But they understood not this saying. It was hid from them they, that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that saying. Often they would not understand something. Uh, another parts of the Gospels, in Luke 24, it says, And he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. He was building this, this whole event. You know, the, the hymn writer says, Open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine, illumine me, spirit divine. So we see the people uh, here, the first of the disciples, the people, and, and then a reference to Lazarus, who was, was, rose from the dead. If you look at verse 17, there's another group of people we see in this crowd. It says, the people, therefore, that was, was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. And I want to kind of isolate that phrase, the dead. You know, even though, you know, there was, uh, even though there was no dead people around when he was coming into the town, there were was, there was some probably graves nearby of dead people. But just think about that, the dead. What, what happens to dead people? What happens when you die? Well, there's, there's two locations you go to. You either go to meet your king, and you're ever with him uh, you know, for, for all eternity in heaven, or you die without Christ, and you go to a crisis eternity in hell forever, where there's burning forever. There's only two destinations for all of mankind. And so even though there was no dead there, dead people are dead, it's something we need to think about. Lazarus was, ro was raised from the dead. Jesus would raise from the dead. He's conquered death. Many people don't have that satisfaction of, of, of what happens after death. What, what happens if I die? People without Christ will die and go to hell. You see, Martha understood death. She understood that her Savior would die. She anointed his body. She understood the death. Lazarus understood death. He was raised from the dead. He wouldn't leave Jesus' side. There was much people around him. And much people wanted to kind of taste that miracle. You know, the, 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 the crowd was gathered because Lazarus was raised from the dead. So many understood that this man has power over death itself. Praise God. You know, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, he's given you that power over death. You will have everlasting life. It's a gift. It's an amazing gift. But as I showed someone just Thursday morning, you know, a gift can be offered by Jesus. It can be rejected. It can be rejected or accepted. And many people, you offer the gift, you tell them that Jesus died for their sins. Uh, Jesus rose from the grave and conquered the death. Here's the free gift of salvation. Here's the free gift of eternal life. And people say, no, nope, I got religion. Or, no, I don't want that. No, I don't believe that. And praise God, some do accept the gift. That's all it is, just accepting the gift of eternal life. And so the dead are here in this crowd, whether you see it or not. And number four, of course, the Pharisees are here in this crowd. If you look later on, it says in verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how we, ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. They're, they're hopeless. Boy, uh, you know, Jesus is destroying their man-made religion here as, as they added to the Jewish law and added all these extra things and uh, put a heavy burden upon people to, to do all these lists of things that they added to God's Old Testament law. And they say, boy, uh, we, ought, we ought to give up, guys. He's just conquered everything. He, uh, he, the, he's now uh, uh, fulfilling scripture. He's the king. Uh, you know, we, we've got nothing. We can't prevail over this. Uh, you know, and the world's gone after him. Now, of course, it's a mixed multitude. It's a multitude that uh, many of these people will uh, cry out to crucify him. So, so not everyone is, is completely committed, but at least the Pharisees think, boy, everybody just loves this guy. Everybody's following this guy. 
You see, Pharisees and the great men were exceeding enraged because, they, uh, because every measure they had taken to hinder the people from following Jesus had proved ineffectual. You see, the world, con the world constantly tries to do that. They want to do things to, to dissuade people. They'll, uh, they'll make the Bible legal. They'll burn the Bible. They'll make it illegal to pray in school. They'll make it illegal uh, to just all these Christian things. You can't do this. You can't yeah, have Christianity in our government. You can't have Christianity in our schools, in this place of business, in this and that. And you, you can't deny service, you know, and, and all these kinds of things. They'll add all these things. Oh, if you're a Christian, you can't, you can't take a stand. You can't have uh, personal beliefs. And the, the often... Many uh, religions of our day will do the same thing, but as much as they try to hinder, they can't stop people from getting saved. Someone got saved this week. You can't stop people from getting saved. If you offer salvation to people, people will see that, and there'll be some that will respond and be saved. On September 30, 2004, the world couldn't have stopped me from getting saved because Jesus showed himself to me. He showed me that I was a sinner, that he died for me, and I chose him as my personal Savior. And many of you have very similar testimony the day you got saved. You chose him as your Savior. Well, the world wants to shut us, shut that down, shut the message up, burn Bibles, change Bibles, delete Bibles, uh, take away God's word, God's spirit, God's truth everywhere, but they can't take away Jesus. He is the king. And so we also see the world, the world. Now, it's not mentioned here in our verse. Well, I, I'm sorry, it is mentioned, but, uh, but it, behold, the whole world is gone after him. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? But, you know, it's kind of their faulty logic here, but it's, there's a great majority, but it isn't the whole world. We know that uh, all the continents weren't represented there. There was other countries, other nations. Of course, now Rome was the uh, military might of the time. It was the world leader. You know, it's, it's like the saying that if America does something, we kind of manipulate other countries because we're so, uh, you know, influential. Uh, you know, China can be that way at times, too, at least with some of the things they do. But, you know, it was a world power. They had influence, but it wasn't the whole world. But you know what? The whole world needs to be saved. For God so loved the world. Go over to John 3. John 3. You're in 12. Just go back to John 3. I want you to see the whole world here. John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that our teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Maybe you've ever heard me say born again. It's where you get it from. And uh, so this, this religious leader, he, he didn't fall, fall into all, all those other Pharisees. He recognized that Jesus was something different. He came to him by night, probably was a little ashamed to come by day, uh, to be seen of his other Pharisee buddies. He came at night. And in verse 4 it says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? How can he be born again? You know, I didn't understand that. Can he enter the second time in a mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The first being born of the woman's water. When the water breaks, the birth canal is ready to, to make the process happen. And then the second, born of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, or don't be surprised that I said unto you, unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so that every one that is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Very impactful statement. How can someone, how can this happen? How can, how can you be born of the Spirit? Go down to verse uh, 15. Oh, let's do 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man uh, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is, uh, uh, is not condemned, uh, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is only one way to get to heaven. It's not good works. It's not this church or any other church. It's not any list of things that man puts to what God has said. God said all you have to do is believe. On the name of the only begotten Son of God, believe on Jesus Christ. Believe on what he did for you. And everyone in their life needs to personally accept that free gift of salvation. That's as simple as it is. And praise God for everyone that has done that. And if you've not done that this morning, simply accept the gift. But let's move on. The world needs to be saved. 
Now, lastly and quickly, the same. You don't have to turn back there. I'll just mention the verse. In verse 21, it says, The same came therefore to Philip, which was at Bethesda of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. The same. And you know what the same truth is we need to understand? Is the same needs to come along with these disciples. And we ought to say to, to Jesus, we ought to say to other people, Sir, we must see Jesus. We've got to see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. We need Jesus all in, uh, in everything we do and all that we do uh, and every function we do and every part of church, every part of our life. We would see Jesus. We should see Jesus. Often when I preach in other pulpits, they put that verse on a pulpit. Uh, often they do that in other pulpits. They put it right on the, uh, the, the front where you put your Bible down. We would see Jesus. It's not about this man. It's about Jesus. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving, fullness see. More of his love, who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving, fullness see. More of his love, who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. You know, there's a guy, I've quoted part of this sermon before. A guy in California, his name was Dr. S.M. Lockridge. And he preached a, uh, a message, and this was part of one of his messages he preached. And he said, it was, uh, uh, I, I didn't write down the title, but I think it was uh, My King or That's My King. And I want to quote part of his sermon this morning. And I need to drink because I, uh, I can't say it like he says it. Maybe some of you are familiar with this quote. The Bible says, My king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He is the king of glory. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define him. He's limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally grateful. He's impartially powerful. He's, in, he's in, in, uh, par, uh, impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that ever crossed the horizon of the world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. He is the fundamental doctrine of all true theology. He is the only one qualified to be the all-sufficient Savior. I wonder, do you know him today? He supplies strength to the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder, do you know him? He's the door to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the door of way of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteousness. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him, but yet he's indescribable. I, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they could not stop him. Pilate could not find any fault in him. Herod could not kill him. Death could not handle him. And the grave could not hold him. Yea, that's my king. That's my king. Let me ask you a question. Is the king your king? Is the king thy king? Is he your king this morning? Hey, we can believe he's king. We can see all the scripture. We can quote all the preachers that have preached about his kingship. But it's one thing to believe it in your head. It's a whole other thing with the heart. Man believeth unto righteousness. Your heart's got to believe that truth. It just can't be in your head. You know a lot of facts. It's got to be a heart-changing, life-changing decision of your heart. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us this morning to understand all that goes into Palm Sunday? He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. I wondered, you'd know him. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Who would say this morning, I don't know if I've ever personally accepted the gift of salvation. I can't look back to a time and place in my life where I, I remember deciding to choose him as my personal savior. We don't have to get saved a million times. Jesus said that it's everlasting life. It's not temporary life to when you sin and mess it up. It's everlasting life. It's the gift of eternal life. It goes on and on forever. But have you ever accepted that gift? 
It's the gift of eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, shall never die, but have everlasting life, life that goes on forever. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you say this morning, I don't know if I've ever done that in my life. I don't know if I've ever put my personal faith and trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And you say, that's me. Uh, I want you to raise your right hand. I don't know if I've ever done that. Would you raise your right hand? I'd like to help, have someone help you with that decision. Let me ask you a second question. Who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? He's not the king of my life. I believe he's the king. I believe he's the king of kings, but I'm not letting him rule my life. He's not the king of my personal life. He needs to be the king of all heirs of my life. He needs to rule and reign my heart, my life, my job, my career, everything about it. But he needs to rule my marriage, my kids. He's not the king of my life. I need to let him be the king of my life. He rules me. Anybody like that? God's not the king of your life, but he needs to be. You know he's king, but you're not letting him be king. Anybody like that this morning? Just put your hand up. I'll pray for you. All right. See that hand? See those hands? All right. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for showing us areas of life or even this truth that you are king, but you're not really ruling all parts of our lives. Lord, help us to just submit to your kingship, submit to your authority that you are in leadership over all that we do, Lord. And we're thankful for how you led in our hearts. I pray you'd help us to apply the words of Scripture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.